Uh, let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you're in the room. We thank you that your presence is you. That your presence is the person of Jesus, the Holy Spirit with us. Your presence is not just a feeling or a mist. But your presence is you in the room with us. So Jesus, right now we just, we, we open up ourselves again to you to hear what you have to say to us. To, to have your spirit move in us, bringing conviction, bringing healing, bringing um, deliverance, bringing change of mindsets. We just open ourselves up to all that you have for us. And we thank you again for the opportunity to just be together. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are here with your people. And we just say, have your way in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just open up our ears, we open up our hearts, we open up our minds to you again. Speak to us, we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you have a Bible, go with me to Mark chapter 2. Let's jump straight into the scripture this morning. Mark chapter 2, I'm from verse 18. I'm going to read... Read through to verse 22. And it says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and the people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is still with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed. And so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Now, I read this passage last time I preached, and I was talking about, about the Lord calling us to be a Jesus-shaped people. And, and this is just a passage that's kind of stuck with me since then, and I really feel there's something that the Holy Spirit still wants to do and speak to us about with regards to this. And so as the, um, the Pharisees and John's disciples came to Jesus, and they were asking him this question. Jesus' response to them was basically saying, what you're doing and the reasons that you're doing it for are essentially outdated. And so Jesus was saying, the times have changed, and therefore what you're doing needs to change. You see, the Pharisees, they didn't necessarily need to fast. In the Old Covenant, you only needed to fast on the Day of Atonement. And John's disciples were fasting kind of in preparation for the kingdom of God coming. They were waiting and expectant for the kingdom of God to come. And Jesus says, you don't have to do that in that way anymore because the kingdom has come because I am here. I have initiated a new kingdom. And so therefore, your old ways of doing things are outdated. They're no longer appropriate in that way. And therefore, he goes on to say, you wouldn't put a new nice patch of cloth to mend an old garment. That's just inappropriate. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't go to a wedding and say, I'm fasting today. You wouldn't do that. You would go and celebrate with the people. You wouldn't pour new wine that's fermenting into an old wineskin because you lose all of it. You lose the wine. You lose the wineskin. Jesus was basically saying, I have come to break the mold of the old. And now what used to happen back in the day, nowadays we, you know, with mass production of everything, we have reusable molds. So if you want to make, um, I don't know, a bracelet, you have a mold and you can make millions and millions of the same bracelet and sell them on Amazon, probably made in China somewhere. And that's how we do things on everything looks the same. But then if they wanted to make something new and unique, they would make a mold They would make the thing, and then they would break the mold because they didn't want that to be replicated again and not using the same thing over and over again. So they would actually break the mold so it was no longer possible. So Jesus comes in and saying, I'm not just changing what you're doing. I'm breaking the mold. 
completely because a new time has come. And so your old practices are no longer appropriate. And so therefore, what is the appropriate response to Jesus when he comes to us with something new? And he says in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Matthew 4, verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The response when Jesus confronts us with something new, the adequate response is repentance. And it's not a one-time thing. When Jesus comes and we recognize that we are sinful, that we've been living life our own way, and we confess our sins, we repent, we change our mind to follow him, he comes and lives into our heart. That's amazing. But That's the beginning of a journey. But we continue repenting every single time he confronts us with his word with something new, something different that challenges us. And the word repentance simply means to change your mind or to perceive afterwards. So something has happened that now causes you to perceive differently. That's repentance. It's not a one-off thing, but God is calling us to be a people of repentance. Repentance is a practice. It's a discipline. It's a... It's a It's a habit, that's it, it's a habit, that we are in the habit of continually, you've said this, Jesus, okay, I repent, I choose to change my mind from thinking this way, and I agree with what you're saying, and I am going to think this way, and that is how we step into the kingdom. Jesus said that um, those who receive the kingdom like a little child, and you know, children are very believing, I guess, they're very trusting, and they will easily change, okay, this is, okay, now we're doing this, okay, now I'm bored, now we're doing this. Whereas adults, I think we've accepted that we are creatures of habit, but the Lord never made us as creatures of habit. He made us as moldable people to carry his spirit. You are not a creature of habit. That's not who God has called us to be. Otherwise, this wouldn't make any sense. And so sometimes we get so stuck in our ways and so stuck in our molds that we're limiting God to what he wants to do. But actually, we need to every single day say, break the mold of yesterday. I know we had a great, I mean, I've had a great time last Sunday. Break the mold of last Sunday because I want what you're doing this Sunday. Break the mold of last Monday at work because I want what you're doing next Monday at work. Even if I hold on, if I hold on to the previous mold, I will lose both. What God is doing, an act of repentance continually, a habit of repentance. God is calling us to be a people of repentance. And this word can, I know when we say this, it's usually... A negative connotation, and I must have done something bad, and that's not always the case. If we go to Acts, and we're going to read chapter 10, and the story of how Jesus confronts Simon, Simon Peter, and he has to change his mind as to what he believes. Acts chapter 10. Now, just remember that Simon was a Jew. It says from verse 1, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, a centurion, he was a Gentile, he wasn't Jewish, of the um, Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror. Just imagine him freezing, what's going on? What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your arms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, who, whose house is by the sea. And the angel who spoke to him had departed. And he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among them who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the house stop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. This is Peter's response. 
By no means, Lord, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again the second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and this thing was taken up to heaven at once. Just pause there for a second. Peter's response wasn't necessarily entirely wrong in the sense that he was a Jew and he was obeying the law. So God had come to him and said, eat this. I I can imagine if I was Peter, is this a test, Lord? Are you testing how faithful I am to the Jewish law? And he's like, I've never done that before. I can imagine even some sort of feeling offended. How can you think I would do that, Jesus? Like, I follow you. I love you wholeheartedly. I wouldn't do that. And the Lord is clearly saying, the time has changed. That was once what I told you to do, but now I'm telling you to do something different. Verse 17, now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might have meant, behold, the men who were sent from Cornelius had made an inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate, and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathering. And he said to him, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. So I ask, why have you sent me here for? It was unlawful for them to mix. But because Jesus had said so, Simon had to make a decision to change his mind and go. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your arms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He's lodging in the house of Simon and Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, the penny drops here, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And he goes on to um, speak to them and to preach the gospel. And in verse 44, it says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcision who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to stay and remain for some days. It had always been God's plan from the beginning to draw all men to himself. He called out the people of Israel to be a blessing to all the nations that would draw people to the one true God. Messiah comes and fulfills this. And but somehow, somehow, even though they, they had read the Old Testament, they'd understood to, to a degree, it still didn't click. But Jesus now fulfills this. But the thing is, God is was already doing this. This is the thing. He was already planning to do this. He's already set this plan in motion. But he gives Simon the opportunity to partake of what is happening if he will only change his mind. If he will only repent and say, actually... 
I have thought this way for so long and I've been taught to think this way for all my life. And it wasn't a bad thing. But now Jesus has come and this is what he's saying. So I must turn and think this way. And he gets to experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into the Gentiles. He gets to witness the new thing that God is doing because God invited him in and he chose to change his mind. How many times have we come across something different? God has spoken differently or we've encountered something different and we've maybe, that's not what I'm used to. I'm just going to stay here in my little comfort zone where it's safe. How many times have we read scripture or heard somebody preach I think that's really cool, but okay, I'm not quite ready to change or go in that direction. How many times have you heard prophetic word? And maybe it's offended you. I can imagine Peter must have felt a little bit offended, and that's what happens sometimes. Sometimes the word of the Lord that comes to us will offend us. It doesn't sound nice. It doesn't feel nice. But we have a choice to repent and agree with what he is saying, and then we will experience his kingdom the other day I was praying and the Lord clearly said to me, he said, Lukundo, you love to hear me speak to you. You love to hear me encourage you. But do you not know that I also speak to you to instruct and to correct and to admonish? Do you not know that I speak to you about things to come and I need you to shift and move so you can step into them? And they're not comfortable. But you just like the comfortable stuff. And that was hard. That was hard to hear. But that is the God we serve. He doesn't just say nicey, nicey things. He confronts us. To draw us into his kingdom. Jesus said, I come to bring a sword, to bring division, to father against son. We don't, we kind of gloss over those scriptures because we're like the nicey, nicey Jesus. But actually Jesus came, the kingdom of heaven comes violently, violently. Because it's a real battle between death and life. But Jesus has won and he's overcome. So he says, the kingdom has come. The time has come for the oppressed to be set free. The time has come for the lame to walk. The time has come for the blind to see. The time has come for those who have been held captive to be released. The time has come for jubilee. Repent and believe. You need to change your position. You need to change your mind and begin to believe that what I have said is true. You need to step out of the old mode and step into the new mode so that you can partake in what I am doing. And for some of us, we may have counted ourselves out. Maybe we thought, oh yeah, sure, signs and miracles, I see it in the Bible. We just read this scripture and an angel appeared to someone when they were praying. Yeah, that's for the Bible. I'm not saying go running after angels, but what I am saying is when we open up our minds to understand the fullness of who God is, our expectation will go from here to here. Because there is so much more he can do. I want to see visions of, of sheets falling down so God can tell me stuff. And as he's talking to me, three people knock up on my door and I know exactly what to say because I've been in his presence and he's been speaking to me and I can bring the word in that moment. I need to change my mind and believe that that is for me. I was created for fellowship with him. I was created to hear his voice. Every single human was created to hear his voice. All we need to do is simply believe. Simply choose to change your mind and accept. I'm going to accept that. That's what you say of me. And I don't want to miss out on anything that you are doing in the earth. So I'm going to change my mind. I may have been used to one thing, but I want the new. A people of repentance. A people who are continually breaking the mold. A people who are not satisfied with doing the same things over and over again. As Einstein said, it's insanity to do the same things over and over again and expect different results. We are not an insane people in Jesus' name. We will not be insane. That's right. I release that. I break that over you. But I honestly do believe that the Lord will want to really challenge us to change our posture, to change our posture, to lay down our pride. The thing is, God resists the pride. If there's pride in us, it's like God does this. Like, that's a strong word. He doesn't just like avoid. He resists the proud. He resists the proud. And so we have to be humble. We have to be humble enough to say, do you know what? I thought I knew, but I don't know. It's like every morning, I want to wake up saying, I don't know anymore, teach me. I don't know anymore, teach me, keep teaching me. Regardless of how old I get, keep teaching me. Because there's always something new. It's always a new day. You're always doing a new thing, God. And I need to shift my perspective if I'm going to tap into what you're doing. I don't want to stay in the old. I want to stay in the new. But the way we do that is a habit and a culture 
of repentance. Why don't we close our eyes for a moment? We're going to give some space for the Holy Spirit to come in and highlight again maybe areas where there is sin because where there is sin, we need to confess and agree with God and say, I've been doing this and it's not right. I'm sorry and I repent. I change my mind from living that way and thinking that's how I'm wired to following your way. Maybe it's like I said before, you've ruled yourself out of the Holy Spirit working in and through you. You need to change your mind and turn around and say, I believe that your word promises that you pour out your spirit upon all flesh. That includes me. And just allow the Holy Spirit to come and highlight different areas. Maybe before when Rian said, Jesus is in the room, and you didn't sense that. Maybe you need to change your mind to say, from I don't sense his presence, I don't know when he's here too. I am his sheep, I hear his voice. And I can know the presence of Jesus. I can experience the supernatural. I can hear him speaking to me. I can prophesy. I can heal the sick. I can do it because the Holy Spirit lives in me. Let's just give him some room. Come, Holy Spirit, come. One of the biggest lies the enemy will tell us, and I believe this is where all other lies almost stem from, is that God does not love us. When we think or when we believe that God does not love us, we're unable to accept anything else that he wants to do or move or say to us. We're unable to accept his good gifts because we somehow think we're not deserving. But that is a lie of the enemy. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that through him we might be saved. So if there's anything that I want us to repent of today is believing the lie that he doesn't love us, but choose to believe that we are loved unconditionally and there is nothing that we could ever do or say to change that. So Holy Spirit, as we, as we sing this song in declaration of the truth of who we are, I pray that you would shift something in us 
that we will wholeheartedly believe and wholeheartedly run into your love and into your truth and your grace and your security. And that from that place of knowing that we are loved and affirmed, we will go out and do amazing things. We will never count ourselves out because you don't count us out. You knew us before you formed us in our mother's wombs. And you have a purpose and a destiny for each and every single one of us. So we say yes to what you say over our lives. And we make this our declaration in Jesus' name. Amen. worshipping but parents in the room we do need you to collect your children so if you can collect your children and feel free to bring them back up there are going to be more refreshments afterwards but we're just going to carry on in this place of worship so feel free to collect them and bring them back up thank you 